Pastor Marianne, Letter and I'm speaking to you all the way from Abecha or Port Elizabeth, the friendly city. And I'm thanking, um, yeah, why, what am I thanking? I'm thankful that Dr. Arthur Frost has asked me tonight to speak to you. So tonight I really want to speak on something where the Lord has been really ministering in my life. Um, and but before I do that, I just want to encourage you to look at all the announcements that you will be receiving on all of the WhatsApp groups, on the, on, on the Facebook page, everywhere. You will be receiving WhatsApps and you will be receiving the announcements of what is happening and where it is happening so that you can make sure that you can be part of what is happening. So I hope you have a, f a fellowship group in your area. And that um, tonight that you will be enjoying what I'm sharing. <clears throat> so tonight we are really um, going to talk a little bit on things that matter again. And, and as usual, um, Dr. Arthur Frost really um, touches the heart of many people. But tonight I am here and I'm so thankful that I get the privilege. But before I do that, I just want to also say that when you sow, the Bible says... Sowing and reaping is a natural cause. It is a natural thing. If you put seeds in the soil, the challenge, uh, the, this, the seed is not challenged to grow. The seed has a purpose. The moment the seed goes into the soil, it's in the right place for it to grow. And so when that seed goes into the soil, there has to be growth. And I'm just looking at my husband's little garden he's got outside. And uh, we have all kinds of vegetables there. And um, you know what? It's amazing. Uh, we didn't have to tell the celery seed to be so beautiful. We didn't have to tell the parsley seed to be so beautiful, nor the, the green beans or the tomatoes or the cabbage. And they all just perform what is in the seed. So the Bible says when you sow, then your, your seed carries power. And so when you sow your finances and you trust the Lord and you keep on trusting the Lord, watch your mouth that you don't speak death to your seeds, eh? Um, then you will see the harvest of what you have sown in your lives. <clears throat> So I'm um, thankful for everyone that's joining me right now. Veronica and Monica, Sheriff, you, you guys are always so on the ball. But do me a favor. Before we continue with this message, won't you just uh, share this link with at least 10 people? Just share the link with 10 people. That way around you become an evangelist for the gospel. And we need to use the waves of media and social media to get across to everybody. So share the link as wide as you can now, right now, and get the people on board. We are going to talk tonight about the right spirit and how Joseph um, has moved things around in his life because of having the right spirit. Very important message. So make sure that you send it. Hi, Kevin and Pam Labuskachny, Raymond, good evening. Great to have you all here coming on now. Um, so tonight, um, and some of you have attended the Father's Heart Conference. I'm sorry, I couldn't be there. We'll be there the next time. And I'm sure that you have been so blessed by just being there seeing what God has done and um, that you have changed in your life is a new life and that is what it is about is to really not hear the word listen people um, do you know what the Bible says the letter kills it's when we have all this knowledge gathered but we don't do what the knowledge is supposed to do in our life so we we don't allow the growth in our hearts and we don't allow the, the Spirit of God to move in our hearts. And so what we have is we've got a pack of knowledge and a pack of rules, but we don't follow any of them. So tonight I want to encourage you, just send out a link quickly to 10 people. Let's get people on board and see how many people we can reach tonight with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's Sunday night and do you know, will you believe it, it's the first week in November. I'm just putting a lozenge in my throat, in my, my cheek, somewhere here, <laughs> because I have a silly nagging sinus drip that wants to come just the moment I start speaking. And so I have a permanent cough, but I'm sorry about that. <coughs> and there we go. So now that we have some people on board, great. Um, just get somebody, um, Teresa Gauss, hello there, and Elise James, it's great to have you there as well. I like to go live because then I can see the congregation. I can see when you come on and I can say hello to you. It is so nice to see all of you first week in November. And um, yeah, we just have a month left and then it's almost the end of the year now. So we're going towards it. So um, let's just quickly pray. Father, we thank you for your word. 
And Lord, I thank you that you have a plan with everyone's life. And as we are tuning into the word of God tonight, I pray, Lord, that you will make the word grow in our lives. And not just that we won't just be hearers, but that we will doers, be doers of the word. Thank you for that, Lord Jesus. I thank you that the seed that we are sowing tonight on the airwaves of social media will will be fruit in Jesus name but we may not know it now but we will see it in the days to come thank you Jesus amen well there you go it is so good so we quickly want to read to you you know what one of um I've learned something that the Lord speaks to me often though you read the Bible but sometimes there is this um, the, the scripture that just comes alive in your heart and man you can do what you like but when you think about that scripture it comes alive it just talks to you the whole time so I don't know if you have got those kind of scriptures in your life but if you want to just open your Bibles or take note of Psalm 51 Psalm 51. Now I know the King James Version has got a different kind of um, translation and I would like to quote the one that I know. Um, that's the one that I want to just quote to you so that you can um, see what I'm trying to say. So when we talk about Psalm 51, we talk about David being in a mess. And because he's in a mess, he writes this psalm and he says, Lord, create in me a clean heart. And... Um, then I, it, it goes on and renew a right spirit within me. That is what the one translation says. It's creating me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Then it says there, do not cast me away from your presence. And please do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. I see four things that are very, very important. You may have a different translation and, and please you're welcome to have that. But these are the four points that I have received from those that scripture. It says, create in me a clean heart and re renew a right spirit within me. And then do not cast me away from your presence and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Four things that I find they are so important in our lives. Because we can sometimes live our lives without realizing the importance of where we are standing with God. You know, we, we all have... <coughs> we all have... <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to take a sip of tea too. We all have different um, um, understandings about what God expects of us and we have different understandings of how we should operate and we have different lifestyles and patterns. But when it comes to the Word of God, there's not much to negotiate. You know, we, we have to follow that because these are the principles of God. So number one, I want you to, to type in those people that are following right now. I want you to type in there and say, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. That's the number one line that we are going to. Psalm 51, verse 1. So why did David say, Lord, create in me a clean heart? Because he just messed up with um, Nathan's wife. He just killed Nathan to get his wife. And he he realized, okay, look, I made a mistake and... And uh, there's consequences and things are not right. But above everything else, I want a clean heart. So why is a clean heart so important? <laughs> you know, we are body, soul and spirit and you all understand that. But your heart is where your memories and, and your information and your joys and your past history and your things is stored in your heart. So when you get to your heart that carries a lot of things, that's why they say, peop uh, you know, if two people are dating, and the one leaves, the, um, the guy leaves the girl. Then she says, my heart is broken. You don't have a broken heart. You've got a hurt in your heart of rejection. You have a hurt of confusion. You've got all kinds of emotions that are coming towards you now. And so it stores up in your heart. So when I say create in me a clean heart, Lord, then I'm saying, Lord, whatever emotion I have, whatever intention I have, anything that is contrary to the Word of God, everything that stands against the Word of God, I want you, Lord Jesus, I want you to take that and I want you to create in me a clean heart. So remove those things that are standing between you and me and just create in me a clean heart. But then, the second line, and I want you to type in, restore a new spirit within me. So in other words, I want the right spirit. He says, restore a right spirit, says the one translation. If you can type in, restore a right spirit within me. 
Now that to me is something very interesting because the Lord spoke to me about that right spirit so many times and during these weeks I've, I've really thought about it and I've really contemplated it and I wondered how the right spirit thing works because why does he say clean my heart but then the next point he says restore my right spirit isn't it somehow connected um why is it two different things when he says restore a right spirit within me and the difference is yeah is this what I'm going to talk about tonight the right spirit because when we have a right spirit, there's a whole lot of the, a whole lot of new things that comes to, to play, and it changes dynamics in your life. But then point number three is, please do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. It says, it says actually cast me not away from your presence. That translation says cast me not. Don't push me out of your presence, Lord. Don't let me sit on the outside of your presence. I want to be on the inside of your presence. There where your Holy Spirit dwells. There where, where, where there's peace, where there's joy, where there's harmony. That's where the presence of the Lord is. I want to be there. So point number three is do not push me out of the presence of the Lord. Let me push me out that I sit on the outside. I see other people being blessed. I don't want to sit on the outside. And the fourth point is and restore unto me the joy of my salvation I, I i think it's actually saying restore unto me the joy of thy salvation in other words lord when i've done i've i've got a clean heart i've got a new spirit i'm not pushed out of your presence now lord just restore renew make me feel again that i have the joy of your salvation because sometimes, you know, we all live lives and we do things and we sometimes we struggle to understand that we actually lost the joy of salvation. We somehow glorify in the, the attributes that we've got, but we've lost the joy of our salvation. And so it's very, very deep to think that when, when David wrote Psalm 51, he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Just, Lord, whatever stands between you and me, just wash it away, create in me. But then he said, renew a right spirit within me. So in other words, don't just create in me a clean heart. No, Lord, I want you to renew a right spirit within me. There's more to my heart. There's more involved in whatever is going on in me. And then he says, and please don't push me out of your presence, O oh Lord. Oh, my word, people, it is a dangerous place to be when we think that we are in control of our lives and we don't understand how God is in control of our lives. And then lastly, he says, and please, Lord, restore unto me the joy that day when I gave my life to Jesus, that, that experience I had when I asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life, when I gave my life to him, when I said, Lord, I forgive me of all my sins, that joy that I felt in that moment. So that is what David said. So let's just look at the life of Joseph. And I want you, if I go a little bit fast, I hope you can catch up. Maybe you need to make notes uh, while I'm talking, because I may just go a little bit fast. But if I go to the life of Joseph, now you all know Joseph, the dreamer. <laughs> Don't we have some people like that in our lives? Say we have Joseph, the dreamers everywhere, and people that's got big visions and ideas and plans. So Joseph was this typical dreamer. Now I want you to take note of what I'm saying. Joseph was 17 years old, so he wasn't a baby. He was already the same age as a normal teenager. In fact, he was um, old enough to get married under the Jewish custom. So he was 17 years old when he had this amazing dream. Now you all know the dream. He said he, uh, he saw this corn and that bowing down. The dream, you can go read it all and it, you, you find the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Verse 37, or chapter 37. Oh, it's so interesting. It's not even a long chapter. Go read it. But the, here's what happens. So Joseph then said to everybody, he told the dream. And he said, um, two dreams. But then the one dream he said, um, Joseph had a dream. And, and this is verse 5. And when he told the dream to his brothers, they hated him more. 
They didn't want him to have this dream. They didn't want him to share the dream. They wanted him not to come with these dreams because they um they they hated the fact that he can dream things and it comes to pass. Maybe he's dreamed before and it came to pass, and so they weren't impressed with Joseph. So when they when he had that dream, they said to him, No, 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 no. We don't like your dreaming business, and you are spoiled. Remember the clothes that Joseph had. He had this. You know this that uh, uh, Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat. You know that all the stories about Joseph in the Bible. Go read it, man. It's very good. But in verse six, chapter thirty-seven, and verse six and verse seven, I just want to read it to you. Actually, <laughs> and um, verse six says, "Listen to this dream I had." I think you know sometimes we mustn't share our dreams. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field. Then suddenly my sheave rose and stood upright. While your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. So that's a bit of a, a dream to have and then make your family feel like they're going to bow to you. Né? So look verse 8. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And then he had another dream. So I'm not going to go to that one. And then in verse, verse 17, in verse 18, he says, But they saw him. Now what happened here is he had these two dreams and the brothers were really angry with him because, you know, this is the strangest thing. If you stand up right, and you stand upright for Jesus without even saying a single word. Because he got the cloak, the beautiful cloak. His mother just loved him. She made him the special cloak. But you know, that was a kind of an anointing that was released upon his life right there. He didn't understand it. The family didn't understand it. Nobody understood it. And so sometimes family members can say, Hey, whatever you are doing is you are bragging, you're presumptuous, you think you're better than us, whatever you are doing. So that's sometimes not so good to share a dream then, hey, or to preach to people. It doesn't work. And so what happens is the brothers were working in the field, and now we're going on to verse 18. The brothers were working in the field, and the father said to, to Joseph, Go and give your brother some food. It was custom that the younger child would take food to the elder brothers in the field. You saw that with David as well when he went out to the brothers when they were fighting, trying to fight Goliath. And then this is what happened in verse 18. But they saw him in a distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. So here is this thing. Now, now I see a lot of things. What do you see in this picture? I see, number one, there's a spirit of jealousy. Yes, they are seriously jealous from their side i also see a spirit that wants to confuse what the plans of god is over joseph's life because you know what sometimes we think if we sell the dream or we kill the dream it will go away but it will not if it's god's plan it will happen and so then they tried to do that they they were nasty to him they said nasty things they didn't like him and so their conversation was often how much they disliked their brother joseph there wasn't that feeling of this is my pretty pretty little brother and my mommy loves him more than us there wasn't that feeling what the feeling was is that he is advanced he is given more favor than us and so because of that they felt they had the right to hate him. Now I see a lot of things, but what will I see here? Let's go on and we read in, we're still in, in, in chapter 37, verse 27, um, actually 26. Then Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and our blood. And so fortunately, the word of God happened that the protection came because of that feeling that was there. But still the brothers weren't happy. So, I mean, imagine being sold at the age of 17. You just sold out to people you don't know. In fact, you, those people you hated because you were taught to hate them. So there he went and they, started, they put him down and they, they wanted to throw him, him firstly in a pit. But then they sold him. 
And so the last verse in chapter 37 says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. So what happened is, we may think, because we know the end of the story. When we know the end of the story, it, it makes a lot of sense, eh? But while the processes are going on, things are happening. Because remember, Joseph is the, the blessed one. He's the one with a special garment. He's the one that has these dreams, a profound young man. He, he has everything going for him, but he has the absolute hate and, and antagonism of his family. And in the process, he is having to stand upright. And I think when I look at Psalm 51, when he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, he must probably said that many times. He says, Lord, I don't want to be angry with my brothers. I love them. And please, Lord, just create in me a clean heart. I don't want to keep um, attitudes against them. I don't want to have revenge. I don't want to have unforgiveness against them. Hey, they deserved all the unforgiveness. They deserved it. They deserved to be hated by Joseph. But what he did is never in the Bible did we see that Joseph sat down and said, I hate my brothers. I hate them for what they did to me. I hate them for laughing at me. I hate them for ignoring the dream. You know, he didn't. It, we didn't see that in the Bible. But when eventually through the, the processes of his life, he is sold and then he went into, and, and chapter 39 is where I really want to land. Chapter 39, verse 2, and I'm going to read chapter 39, and this is now the book of Genesis, ne? Genesis chapter 39, verse 2. Then I like this, I like this. I think when I read about creating me a clean heart in Psalm 51 and renew a right spirit within me, I see a lot of things in the life of Joseph, that right spirit. That spirit that doesn't hold grudges. That spirit that chooses to be in the right standing, not with men, but with God. The spirit of peace, the spirit of harmony, doesn't matter what happens in your life, to stand upright before the Lord and say, Lord, clean my heart, but renew a right spirit. Let my spirit be in right standing with Jesus Christ. Let my spirit be the spirit that reads and understands the word and the will of God for my life. So here in chapter 39, verse 2, which is really very good, the Lord was with Joseph. Isn't that profound? So that when he prospered, Joseph prospered, and he lived in the house of the, his Egyptian master, when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Now this is the thing. Do you know you see these people? They live their lives. Things come against them. Things are not always right. They are bullying. They are put down. They are, but somehow you see this favor upon their lives. They, you can see it because you know what? You see their lives. Um, they do not hold things that's negative in their hearts. They walk with a smile even though it doesn't look good. They, they, they um, do not talk bad about people. They do not break down people. They, they don't, do not even speak bad against the wind. Is the truth is, inside of them is the right spirit. The spirit that says, I am in a right standing with Jesus Christ. And of course, if I'm in the right standing with Christ, I pick up the spirit that he has. The spirit of peace, the spirit of joy, the spirit of happiness. So when Joseph found favor and in the house of Potiphar and he got this fancy new job and he got a promotion, he knew he's doing very, very well. Lo and behold, what happened? There's always the situation that wherever in your process that you are going. Like remember, Joseph's um, dream was not to rule in Potiphar's house. His dream was not to be famous anyway. His dream was that people will bow down to him. Was it right? The sheaves and the moons and they bow down to him. That was his dream. And in that dream, he knew there's much more 
than just being in Potiphar's house. But while he's in the processes of being sold, being hated, being in, in a good place with fortune, with money, he never negotiated on the right spirit. He never negotiated on his heart status. He never negotiated on the presence of God. He never negotiated about the Holy Spirit and he always had the joy of the Lord. We don't read that in the Word of God, but we don't read the contrary. We don't read that he was angry. We don't read that he was bitter. We don't read that he was throwing around cups and saucers and, and giving people lip and saying, this is unfair. Do you know who I am? Do you know I come from Potiphar's house? Do you know that I, I'm a good boy, a Jew boy? Do you know my mother made me that clock? Do you know my brothers hated me? And let me tell you, let me tell you, you know, this is how we are. When somebody goes through a tough time, I will tell you what's tough, my brother. You don't know what tough is. Wait until you hear my story. He never, you, we don't hear that in the Word of God. But there's one place where he said something, and we're going to go to that. So while he's in Potiphar's house, you all know the story. Potiphar's wife, because the Bible says he was gorgeous. It says there he was beautiful. He was gorgeous. He was everything. This woman had a problem. She had a spirit of lust. And she wanted to, 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 to take advantage of the situation with Joseph. And man, Satan wants to take advantage of you. He will use anything possible to get you out of course, off course, away from the purposes of God and remove you away from the process to where God wants you to be. And then she started flirting with him. She grabbed his cloak and then the Bible says in verse 16, and I'm now in, in Genesis 41, and she took the cloak. And she kept his cloak and she told her husband, this man was flirting with me. That is what, and that is in, um, actually Genesis 39. Then we go to Genesis 40. And the process goes on. People, the process sometimes in your life feels like everything is just too much for me. Why must I go through this? Why must I struggle with this? Why must this be so difficult? Why is serving the Lord such a, a chore in my life? Why? Why is it so difficult to pray? Why can't I just be, I look at Dr. Arthur Frost and I see what he's doing and I, that's what I want to do. And you think you actually know how quickly it came. But there was a process involved and God is busy with your process. And if you allow him to work in your process, a process end result will be the blessing for the nation. I didn't know many years ago when I met Dr. Arthur Frost that he will touch, will be touching the nation of South Africa at the rate he's doing it now. I didn't know it. I knew him as a friend. But let me tell you one thing. When God is in the process of your life, don't allow the devil to steal away from you. The good thing that Pope Joseph did is when Potiphar's wife came on to him is he ran. That's for no. That is the reason. Why the Bible says you must run from the appearance of evil. Anything that appears evil, I know. Sometimes we don't think it's evil. Sometimes we think it is a perfectly healthy, okay situation and I'm on top of it. But the truth is, if Joseph did not run away at the time, she would have had the upper hand and things could have turned really belly up. But let me tell you, when he ran, he knew it wasn't going to be good for him. I mean, you don't play around in these, these high-rank officers' houses and do what you want to do. There's going to be a consequence. And here the process continues again. Same poor Pope Joseph. So the, the, the Potiphar got so mad, he chucked Joseph in prison. And so there Joseph sits in prison. And now <clears throat> I want you to understand, landing in prison there, and you're a Jew boy is not like, I think our prisons are like a five-star hotel sometimes. It's, it's isolation, but it's not a 100% prison like those days. It is a place where they leave you to die. It's a place where you will never see your people again. It's a place where it seems like your process is stopping. It seems like your process in towards the plan of God for your life is now in a bad place. If it's not the pit, if you're not sold, if you're not put into a, a place where a woman comes on to you, if you're not and now suddenly in prison, Lord, it's over. <laughs> and sometimes we do that. But here comes the story. 
Joseph didn't, he never came to a place where he said, Oh Lord, you hate me. You don't understand me. You've rejected me. He never did. We don't read that in the Bible. So he clearly never complained. He sat in the process. Because I tell you what, if you think of it, when he had the dream at 17, the dream was such a reality in his life. I think, and it doesn't say it in the Word of God, doesn't say it, but I think the dream was the anchor that kept him going, kept him going. Because somehow in his own heart he would say, I know things are not looking right, but I remember that dream. There's going to be a day that I will understand what the dreams mean, those two dreams. And that day will come, I don't know how, I don't know when. And so here he lands in prison. And now verse um, verse, verse is now uh, chapter 40 verse 14 so these two guys the baker and the, the cabera the wine whatever you call that the, the two guys were both in prison and they both had dreams and um, Joseph interpreted the dreams first for the cabera because the cabera gave him his dream you know you can read it then in uh, uh, chapter 40 verse 13 and then he gave him the explanation. But this is what Joseph said to the Kabira in verse, verse 14. For the first time we see Joseph coming out and saying there is a purpose for my life. I know I didn't just have a dream. I have a purpose. I may just be in the process, but I'm going towards the end result. The result. Verse 14 he said, but when all goes well with you, Remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of prison. This is the first time we read this. Then verse 15 he said, This is the first time Joseph, we see that he says whatever has happened in his life. He says that I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. <coughs> now, I want you to think of a dungeon. When I, when we went to, uh, to, 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 to Scotland, they took us up there in, in uh, what is that place's name? If you, some of you have been there, they took us into the dungeons where the prisoners were kept. And all the prisoners were sitting in a dungeon that was dark, it was cold. Their feet and often their hands were tied to the wall. There wasn't place to move. And some of them would scratch on the walls with their fingers to try and make a mark just to count the days, how many days they are in prison. The dungeon is not a wonderful place. And it is such an important thing. Because if ye, Joseph, at that time, realized or said to himself, rather said to himself, the dungeon is the place where you are forgotten. Where God has forgotten you, where things will never go right again, you have had it, Booty. You're gone. But he did it. When he, when he gave the interpretation of the dream, he said to this young man, he said, But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. So this is, this is literally where we read the whole story, where he said, this is important. I want you, somehow, I think when he interpreted that dream, he somehow knew God is busy in the back. Because he is busy with what the end result is. And in that time, I didn't hear him saying, and I hate my brothers. And I hate the Hebrews. And I hate the Jews. He never said that once. He just said, I have a future ahead of me. There's a purpose for my life. When you go there, please think of me. Because I know I'm innocent and I do not belong here. He did not say, I do not belong here because I'm, I'm innocent because you. And you know, see, he said, there's a purpose for my life. He knew it. And this is the thing, your process can take you through places. It can take you through phases. <laughs> it can take you through years. 
And then the baker gave his dream and then the story goes on. And then the baker said whatever he said. But then, chapter 41, this is where I think we will land the story. Then we see there in chapter 41 that this Kabera was going then to eventually went back, he's restored, and he started serving the king, Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh had a dream, <laughs> and nobody could interpret this dream, and so, oh, sharp moment, F suddenly, remember two years, the Bible says, two years went by, There's, there he sits, Joseph, I think in two years' time, he thought to himself, hey, I know I've got it. There's a purpose. There's a dream. There's a purpose. There's a plan. But Lord, it's two years. Am I forgotten again? Are they pushing me aside again? Is there no end to the processes in my life? Because this process is just comes. They come and they go. And it seems like it goes on and on. Let me tell you something. At this time, Joseph was 30 years old. So when he had his first dreams, 17 years, 13 years passed, he sits in this dungeon now, everything is coming and going around him, but he still had a dream that he knew that God is in charge of the dream, and look what happened, Pharaoh had a dream, and you know about the, the fat cows and the thin cows and the, the corn and everything, you know the story, go read it in chapter 41, my story is, that when the cupbearer remembered about Joseph and Joseph came into position and Joseph was the one interpreted the dream, interpreting the dream and then he became a prime minister. Again, people, being the prime minister wasn't the fulfillment of the purpose. The prime, a position. Let me just give you this instruction from God tonight. Being in a position doesn't make you anything unless you complete and fulfill and live out the purpose for God of God in your life. You have to live out the purpose. So here is the point where Joseph now has to start coming into purpose. Remember now, there were seven years of fat years, another seven years. Seven years they built storages, they planned, he was the best politician ever. May the Lord give us politicians like Joseph. So Joseph started building and investing and bringing uh, food into the storehouses. He did everything that he wasn't prepared for that. But God enabled him at that time to complete the process. Listen here. When the, when the, strike, when the um, hunger came, when the, the lack came, when the drought came, Everything was in position, not just for Joseph and the Egyptians, but also for the Israelites. Fulfilling your purpose is a complete different thing. You may think today that whatever you go through is about one thing, but God says, no, I'm pushing you and I'm, ex I'm excelling your, your, your speed and I'm making you going into a place where you can fulfill your purpose. But here, keep your heart clean. And ask the Lord, give me the right spirit, the right standing with Christ. I do not want to have bitterness. I do not want to have hatred. I do not want to have unforgiveness. And then, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Let me always remember how good you were to me. And so when eventually it happened that Joseph's own brothers came. Now, that was a very good time to call them and say, excuse me. I just want to have a chat with you. Who do you think I am? And remember that dream? And who do you think you are? Dungeon to, with a lot of you. He could have. He had all the right. But he didn't. And he went as far as even bringing restoration in the family. He came in bringing healing into the Jewish nation. He brought restoration not just for Joseph, not for his position, not for his life, not for anybody. He walked with the right spirit before God. Now what I must say, let's go back to Psalm 51. Created me a clean heart, O God. It's not about what happens in your processes. It's about your heart. Remember Psalms also says, guard your heart above 
everything else. In other words, put a guard here that you do not allow bitterness and unforgiveness and, and hatred and, and all these emotions and depression and anxiousness and anxiety and everything that goes against a healthy heart, a joyous heart, as in my fourth point. If you say that, Lord, guard my heart. If you get to the place where it doesn't matter what happens around you, and I know people are going through tough times. I'm counseling enough people to know it is not fun and jokes out there. It is a difficult, difficult life. But in the process of going to where God wants you to be, say to the Lord, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Remove all these things that shouldn't be there. Anything that's, that stands against you and me, Lord, remove it. And secondly, renew a right spirit within me. That spirit is the one that says, I'm in right standing with God. And then please, Lord, do not push me out of your presence. Let me always know that I'm in the place where there's celebration, kingdom celebration. I want to be in the place where your gentleness is. I want to be in the place where your goodness is. I want to be in the place where the Lord stands. And then the last one he says, and restore unto me the joy. So if you are standing tonight feeling everything is against you, it's like you are running in circles. I want you to think of Joseph's life. And I want you to say Psalm 51. Get yourself there. And tonight I want, I want you to know that the bitterness in our hearts can destroy not only ourselves. It does. It des destroys you. People do not forget. They do not. Um, that hurt you. They do not. Um, it's not right that we forgive them. But the Bible says if we forgive them. It's like the Lord's Prayer. As he forgives us, we must forgive. But not just that. When you forgive, you set yourself free. When you ask the Lord to put the right spirit in you, that spirit that's in the right standing with God. What is that? Forgiveness, joy, peace, happiness. You all know the fruit of the spirit. That's, that is the right spirit. Well, when we get to the place where we're constantly, every day, thanking Jesus for who he is in our lives, for what he's done in our lives. You don't preach to the people, man. Talk to God. And so I think in the scripture and in what I've said, I trust that the Lord has spoken to you because he needs to restore a right spirit in each one of us. <laughs> Doesn't matter what happens. I mean, the dungeon is not a, a fun place to be in. The food is scarce. It's cold. It's, you are bound up. You have bad company. You, you don't even belong there and you're innocent and all these things are happening right there. But to have a right spirit changes everything. Because God sees the heart of a man. And that is where the reward comes from. Look what the Lord has done for Joseph. And his dreams came to pass. How many times have you had a dream that you just squashed because you've given up on your dream? Because you thought the process is killing your dream. No, the process is not killing your dream. You choose to keep the dream. You Keep your heart lean and the Lord will work out in the process, the end result. If your marriage is not doing well, I know abuse is never right. So I'm not saying forgive the abuser. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying set yourself free. Get out of it if you are abused. But sometimes it just takes forgiveness to restore a relationship. It just takes a bit of smile and laugh and, and just good things to restore relationships. But sometimes the Lord wants you to walk away. And I know there are people here when I talk to you, you have to sometimes, like Joseph had to run away from Potiphar's house. The situation in Potiphar's house was brilliant. He had everything he wanted. He could have stayed there and had a relationship with Potiphar's wife. Who would know? And the, the people will talk about it. But as long as Potiphar didn't know you would be safe, you would be coining it, man, coining it, good money, status and everything. But he chose to have a right spirit. He chose to walk in uprightness before the Lord. Just want to say this. God sees your heart and he knows what you are doing. So I know. I see the um, Sherry said, this is the right word for you, Sherry. The Lord says tonight, 
that this, the process in your life has been very painful and that you have felt at times that you've been pushed in a corner, Sherry, that things are taken out of your hands and out of your control. And you've cried before the Lord. I actually see you crying before the Lord, crying, crying, so sobbing, saying, God, how do I get out of it? And the Lord says, today I will heal your hurt and your heart. It's come a long way. The pain has come a long way. But the Lord's restoring you tonight. He's also restoring your confidence. He's restoring your confidence in Him. Because you even doubted the Lord. And it's okay. He's not worried about that. But tonight, Sherry, I'm praying that the Lord will make you feel the joy of your salvation. Make you feel how the much the Lord loves you. And that He's not pushed you aside. The situation is not going to overwhelm you. I want you to lift up your head tonight. And I want you to stand look yourself in the mirror tonight and say, I am strong because God makes me strong and He is in my process. Doesn't matter what my process is, Sherry, God loves you. And He's got a plan for your life. And then I see um, Madeleine, I mean, Madeleine says, um, Abuse is not acceptable. You're totally right. Abuse is not acceptable. And there are many ways in and out of it. But this much I say, anybody that's been abused, you must get out of it. But if you choose to stay where you are, don't see the Lord as the process one. See how circumstances try to squash you. But God's going to help you. If you are abused in an abusive relationship and you're not married, get out quickly. Just walk away like, man, just leave your cloak behind. Sometimes we have to leave things behind to just get out. But I pray for everyone tonight that's in an abusive relationship, an abusive marriage, even children that are abused in their homes by their parents. I pray that you will feel the love of Jesus Christ tonight. And even if you feel like you're sitting in a dungeon and it's cold out and you're not feeling good, God is going to bring you through. And He's going to show you the way out because He is like that. Sometimes it just doesn't look good. But God's going to show you the way out. And I'm praying for every one of you. There's also a businessman that's watching this. I don't know if you are watching now on the restream. But I want you to know you've been feeling that your big dream is squashed because, you, because of the lack of finances and because of mistakes that you've made in the past. But tonight I'm, I'm praying that the Lord will bring confidence back into your heart. And that you will write down your dream. Just write it down. Lay your hand on the dream and say, I will keep a right spirit. The Lord is going to bring me through. And sometimes you have to let go of friends that's been involved in the business like a partnership. You have to break and let go of some things. But God will bring you out and restore you when you trust Him with your whole heart. You know the Bible is full of heart. And I feel that tonight you need to trust the Lord with your whole heart and not rely on your own understanding or your friends or the people that's in partnerships with you. God wants to bring restoration to you. He wants to bring restoration to you. Well, everyone, this is the story in a nutshell. I trust that the Lord has blessed you as much as I am blessed by just sharing with you the scriptures and the, the life of Joseph. And I want to pray for everyone. And if you have a special prayer request, um, um, and uh, if, you've, uh, if you are uh, Sherry, thank you for responding. If you've got a special prayer request, if you've got anything that we, you want us to pray for, and if you can in the next two minutes just quickly type, pray for my business, pray for my marriage, pray for my children, pray, whatever you can type through right now, just send it through now. Type it now. Unfortunately, not in the restream. I won't be able to see it on the restream. Our time is up and I need to go out now. So I want you to quickly type what you want us to pray for so that we can come in agreement with the plan and purposes of God for every one of you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So while I'm praying, I'm just going to keep my eye on the screen to see who's coming through. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you now, Lord, that you hear us and you answer us. And Lord, like Joseph had 13 years before he saw the fulfillment of his dream. And so many people, I see, Lord, um, many people are struggling with, with, with problems in their lives. It seems like they're running in circles, Lord. But tonight I'm praying for everyone on this group, Lord. I'm praying that you bring us out into a place. I see these marriages. I see these children, Lord. This wisdom, Father, I pray for everyone tonight in the name of Jesus. 
Lord, that you will bring them out, Lord. Show them the path of righteousness. Let them keep a right standing before you. Let them keep their hearts clean. But Lord, in this process, show them the right way in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for healing of broken hearts. I pray for restoration, Lord. Oh, Father, I thank you that you are healing and bringing our children back, Lord Jesus. That our children start serving you, Lord. In Jesus' name, send your angels, send ministering angels over their lives. Let them go and, pray and minister to them in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you as, as David says, renew a right spirit. And Lord, he said, restore unto me. Lord, let them experience the joy of salvation in Jesus' name. And for everyone in business, Lord, I thank you for supernatural favor. That you will increase them in favor in Jesus' name. Increase them in favor. Heal relationships. Restore marriages. Bring, bring open doors in businesses. Father, let, let finances come in a supernatural way. And Father, I thank you for when our hearts are standing in right, upright standing before you, Lord, that you, are, you see our hearts. And that is what you work on. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you. And um, yeah. It's a new day, new month, and we're going forward in the goodness of God. God bless you. Have a super lovely, blessed week.